Um, so this ends part two um, of our interview with Timothy Burt. Um, and what we now would like to do is start part three of our interview um, where we talk about uh, ways that members can protect themselves and protect their children um, from harm and from abuse. So, uh, Tim, why don't we go through these really quick? Thank you. The first one is I ask people to consider having a meeting with their bishop or stake presidency. Inform them of the issues that, um, about the current policies. If you're agreeing with Sam and assign the petition, you know, share that with him. Share the links to all the stories. And just ask for, for parents to get involved with your church leaders and to, to have a conversation with them. That's number one. The second part of so, that so is... So let me just, I'm going to just repeat these. So, uh, so meet with your bishop and stake president and inform them and to teach them. Now that's hard because we're in a system where our leaders aren't used to being questioned. They're not used to advice in many cases. Mm -hmm. And we're not used to feeling empowered that they want our feedback, right? Right. So that's so hard. We, so we can be examples for our children, though. We can be examples for our children to stand up and say, hey, we're there to protect you. We're there to talk to, to power, to talk to authority, to talk to difficult things. Um, and we'll be an example for that. Because um, children are going to need the ability to, to be able to stand up and, and, you know, and question people who may be um, potentially mistreating them. And sometimes that requires talk, talking to people that it, it, it's hard to. So we need to be advocates for our children. Right. All right. So the second thing is share your own story. If you have your own story of how these things didn't go well, you know, what your experience was with a child interview, with your experience with, you know, feeling guilt over masturbation or when you went in or, you know, that, you know, you felt like the lit cupcake or um, your own story of sexual harassment and so forth with your bishop, because it's hard for them to say, well, these things don't happen. Say it happened to me. It happened to me. And if it did, that, it, when you say it happened to me, it's hard for them to say, oh, this isn't a problem. I say, yeah, it was a problem for me. So I need you, to, I'd like to ask you to be respectful to my children. Um, so share your, the second point is to share your stories if you have them. Share your stories because that, it's often, that's the whole premise of Mormon stories, that stories have an impact. Uh, they touch people emotionally, they hook people, they get people's interest. And stories have a way to change hearts and minds that sometimes logic and evidence don't. Right. So share your stories. All right. That's number two. Number three. Number, number three is don't support. If you don't support the practice of one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, interviews, tell your bishop you don't support that and that you would prefer not to have your, your child, um, you know, in interviews uh, discussing sexuality or worthiness and um, that you're un, comfortable allowing your younger underage kids to be interviewed alone or asked inappropriate questions and informing them that you will not consent or allow the church leaders to do to request those with your children. And I've done that in the past and I think that's great. However, I, I hear there are some members receiving negative repercussions for doing that. Have you heard that? Yeah, I have. Like kids, so, kids being told they can't go to the temple or parents yeah. having their temple recommends being removed. Like, yeah. People being told they're not worthy. What have you heard? I've heard that. I've heard that. It's not happening in my stake, but it's happening in other places. Yeah, I've heard that, that it's happening. And so I say, go up the line, you know, and then you're responsible for you and for your interaction with them. And so you're setting an example for your kids and you don't have to consent to, to these kind of practices. So what I say in the next point is that, you know, suggest um, to your local leaders, viable alternatives that are used in other wards and stakes to support the spiritual development of youth that don't require one-on-one -on -one youth interviews, but that may help them feel like they're doing their pastoral role. Okay. So the first one of that is don't do youth interviews at all. And if the youth wants to go to the temple or have a calling and he wants to do it, let him do it. You know, if they want to be, do this and they, you know, you can say, Hey, you know, as part of this, we'd like you to, you know, it's, it means that we're, you know, you're hoping to, you know, follow the direction of the church. And, and you know, that's what this is involved in. They say, ah, I'm, I want to do this. Let them do it. Um, if they won't, um, you know, sign up for that. The next thing is let's look at some alternatives. One alternative may be, you know, asking the bishop if he needs to provide interview questions to submit them in writing to you as parents. 
you review them and the ones that are okay, give them to your kid and your kid can answer them and put them in a seal and envelope and send them back. You know, if it has to go back and forth, that's fine. So it is, gives them the opportunity to get the information they feel they need, but it doesn't require a one-on-one -on -one interview. It doesn't have to require a interview at all. And it allows the parents to review the questions. Right. right. Yeah. And so okay. the parent says, this is inappropriate. It's good. So if that doesn't work, you can have the, ask the, the bishop and the stake president to interview the kids, in, not interview, but talk to the kids in groups and saying, hey, you know, we got to go to the temple. You know, the temple's important because of this, this, and this. And, you know, we like you to feel good about going to the temple. And these are the things we'd like you to think, feel good about. If there's all of you are good about that, sign up. If, if anybody doesn't feel good about that, you know, you know, you don't have to come. And it's fine. You could, you know, have a basketball game or whatever like that. And uh, you don't have to come. But you could set the standards in groups without having to have one-on-one -on -one interviews. Okay. These are very creative thoughts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so another, then if that doesn't work, you could just sit down and discuss with the bitch. Hey, look, one-on-one -on -one interviews don't work. I know you want to find out about, you know, how they're doing. Do you have a way? And does a kid have a way to be able to do that? Let's come up, let's be creative. We just don't want this one-on-one -on -one thing. We just don't want to have to be this interview thing. What do you think we can do? Have a dialogue. Have a dialogue about them. So that's the last part of it. So, Okay, and I, I'm just going to say that I don't know that the church is comfortable with people coming up with their own little approaches and ideas. I like the spirit of what you're suggesting, mm -hmm. but we're so freaking correlated. It's like a, a McDonald's cheeseburger has to be the same in China as it is in the U.S. And the same with the church. The church has to be run the way it's run everywhere that it is run uh, the same way. And so I'm guessing that this is just, uh, creativity that members and leaders aren't used to. It, it probably is, but there are some congregations and wards that are doing stuff like this. There are. That's awesome. All right, good. Well, let's hope that people so, can so do it. The next thing is if the bishop it, or church leader insists on interviews, they don't go for this creative thing that we don't have to have an interview. Then we suggest that, you know, the parent or a, or, or an adult of the child's teach uh, choosing are in the room. Okay. And that we, you know, and it could be it could be the parent or you know that somebody of the child's choosing. Now, in my stake, they're doing this, and there is some little pushback, some from kids who don't want you know their mom in the room. I wouldn't want my mom in the room if I had to talk about things, but I shouldn't have been talking about those things in the first place because I shouldn't have been talked about it. I shouldn't be asked about them at all. But um, so we're asking to to say, okay, if we need interviews, it's two people in the room, one of the child's choosing. On the rare circumstance that that the child's not requesting the interview or a meeting rather than the church. Cause a lot of these interviews are requested by the church leader, not the kid, you know, on the rare things, Hey, I really need to talk to the bishop about something, you know? Okay. Then what we suggest is that the child suggests who else is in the room. And if they don't suggest anyone then the bishop can say, okay, it'll be the second counselor. Now, if it's women, a woman, we're saying, Hey, it'd probably be good to have maybe some women involved, but that's really going to shake up the, uh, shake the boat. But that'd be great. Why, why shouldn't be women great. be involved? Yeah. I, I, I think they should. And I think yeah. actually bishops shouldn't be interviewing, you know, young 12-year-olds, you know, girls. I, I think that the young women's leader should, you know, discuss with them, hey, do you feel good about going to the temple? You know, how are things going? Um, right. Okay. We need to let bishops know that they're civilly and criminally responsible if they don't report abuse correctly. And they're also civilly responsible if they divulge uh, confidential information and they can get sued and they have been sued and it costs them and, and the church a lot of money. So don't, you know, you know what you're doing. Okay. Okay. So the next one is consider asking a church leader if they will commit to follow basic church um, um, child protective songs and never do one on one. Just ask them, will you commit to do this? You know, and see what they see if they, and they'll have too deep leadership. Will you commit to follow these standards? Nice. Okay. Commitment pattern. Yep. And um, the next one is prepare, invite and follow up as I was taught. Yep. Abs absolutely. <laughs> the next one is consider asking bishops and church leaders not to provide sex education to your children, to not tell them what masturbation is to not, you know, if, if they feel they have to talk about, you know, do you live the law of chastity? What the current handbook says is that's the only question you ask. You don't follow up, but that's not true because if you look at the new interview standards for missionaries, it basically says go in detail. And it also says that, you know, if they've had one of these or these kind of violations, they have to have this waiting period. And 
if they've done some of these things, they're ineligible for missionary service. So they're really doubling down on, on some places. So, but on little kids and, and teenagers, you shouldn't do any, you know, sex education in a one-on-one -on -one interview before I close doors. Now in our state, we're not doing that. The bishops have been told not to do any sex education. Definitely not. And that's good. I love it. Okay. So next one's on masturbation, you know, Masturbation is a, is a really difficult one because most members of the church think that masturbation is still a sin. Um, the church handbook of instructions doesn't say anything about masturbation, and that's deliberate. But the, but the strength of the youth pamphlet says don't arouse your passions. Yeah, and so that makes people think it's masturbation. Now, there's lots of people like in my state that don't, so think that's not that. But it, 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 there is a mixed message, and there is some, like I said, on LDS to Order, there is one thing that does say that masturbation is a sin, but it's a it's it's it revert, refers to that love and lust talk from Kimball way back. Um, You're basically saying de declassify masturbation yep. as a sin. Yep. yep. And 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 if, if the bishop asks about that, say find it in the handbook, show it to me. Because they can't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a personal matter. It's uh, an important personal matter that people you know um, most kids do it. You know all these kids. You know they. You know, they masturbate, they go back, they try, they swear it off, they do this, they do that. And, oh, kids have killed themselves over this. Kids have had problems in marriage, you know, that you come and you say, well, I masturbated, you know, because I didn't, couldn't finish and I have to confess to my husband. And, you know, oh, my gosh, it's awful. Okay, so. All right. Okay, so. next one is um, consider uh, that you want to discuss the damage has been done by, um, by youth uh, to youth by uninformed teaching about sexuality. I think that, you know, it's good to be able to let bishops know that, you know, that it's not okay to, to talk about these sexuality things, especially, you know, you don't know that they're victims. Um, many lessons that are taught are profoundly damaging, lip cupcake. I'm just saying, can you talk to your bishop and your young women's leaders and say, hey, we have a real problem with this lip cupcake, the, you know, holes in the board, the, you know, the, those kind of teachings. And we want to make sure those aren't done in our, in our work. What can we do? Have a dialogue. What can we do to not have that kind of thing? What can we do to teach about consent, respect, and responsibility? All right. So help educate your church leaders about harmful and less harmful approaches to law of chastity. And then the next part of this component of talk, our itch point, is that um, to have mental health professionals available to take referrals for, you know, people that need to do marriage counseling, issues around sexuality, abuse, and they need to be qualified. You know, if you're referring somebody who's, you know, had sexual abuse issues, you need to refer them to somebody who, to a therapist who has training. In how, do mem how does the layperson or a bishop know the difference between a qualified therapist or coach or an unqualified therapist or coach? Well, the first one is that they're, uh, the most basic thing is that they're a licensed therapist in the area. Um, the second thing is that we do need to be, develop some resources for bishops and stakes to be able to have a list of qualified people. And, and you know, professionals can kind of suggest some criteria for that. You know, that they have some training in evidence-based practice that deals with, you know, responding to child trauma. Um, you know, do they have training in child focused cognitive behavioral therapy? Do they have cha training in one of the other evidence based practices to treat child trauma? Do yeah, they know anything about it? What I don't think people understand is that um, just like you wouldn't go to a, you know, a podiatrist for brain surgery, um, just, just because a dermatologist went to med school doesn't mean they can you know, perform a vasectomy well. Uh, right. so, psychology and, and marriage therapy and, and those sorts of things, just because you're a psychologist or a licensed clinical social worker or a marriage and family therapist doesn't mean you're an expert in evidence-based treatment of PTSD or, right. Right. or of obsessive compulsive disorder or trauma. Those things are specialties that you want a specialist. Right. And Childhood sexual abuse or, or post-traumatic stress disorder are specialties, and you don't want to just get any generic depression or anxiety therapist, even if they're licensed, to right. be dealing with issues that merits a specialty. Isn't that true? 
Absolutely. And so the, the church has lots of resources and can reach out to professional groups. I mean, Mormon Mental Health Association, they can reach out to the, 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 the sex therapist. They can work, reach out to others and say, and develop lists locally of people to refer to. Um, every stake should have that. Every stake should, and they should know the criteria to look for and have conversations with those. They don't have to be church members. Um, right. They, yeah. That's right. And, and if you don't know, if you don't know, go to, if you have a children's advocacy center in Utah, they're called a children's justice center. If you don't know, go to them because the children's advocacy center, they have criteria and training. And one of the criteria to be a children's advocacy center that, you know, meets the, meets the standard is that you have to have referrals to qualified mental health professionals who have training in dealing with, with child sexual abuse treatment. So your local children's advocacy center will know the people in your community. If you're, and not all communities have one, but many do. So check and see if you've got a children's advocacy center or a children's justice center, and they'll know. That's great. Or you can call the National Children's Alliance, which is the organization that certifies children's advocacy centers um, to find a children's advocacy center in your area or region. Yeah. All right. Okay. The next one is ask, consider um, asking church leaders to hear accounts of how the church and its leaders have hurt people in the past. I mean, consider asking them to read Sam's stories. You know, if they don't think it happens, have them, have them read Sam's stories. Or tell them your own stories. Or tell them your own stories. I went over that one last time. Okay. Yeah. Now, the next K is women leaders to be involved when, you know, when women need to, sec to discuss sexuality. Now, that's a big ask, but it's not, it's, it's obvious, I think. Um, Although it's not a foregone conclusion that just having a woman there will make the discussion better. No, it's not. Because the problem is that, that, you know, we need some training for people. And so that would require lots of training for all the people that are in the room to know how to deal with that and, you know, and to see who it is. So there are some challenges with that, but the idea of it, of, of, you know, having a woman have to go to a male to talk about some of these sexual issues about, you know, domestic violence, about, you know, child abuse, about, you know, um, you know, these kind of things. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. Um, and so we need the better way to deal with that. You know, one way maybe includes more women, you know, um, but, um, it probably is refer people to, to, to qualified uh, professionals, but having a dialogue of how we can make it easier for, for women to, you know, to, to discuss these things when they, if they feel like they have to. And I'm talking about more when the woman wants to come to them rather than when they're saying, okay, you know, we need to interview this, you know, 14 year old right. girl. Right, yeah. right. Okay, good. Uh, okay, the next one is um, we talked about before consider doors in, or windows in bishops' doors. I think we had a good discussion about that earlier. Plus and minus is about that. Secondly, um, consider having the, all members that are allowed to work with, with youth have a criminal background check. Um, check. Um, also, a, a, a central registry check. So it's not just criminal background check, but it's a central registry. Most states. You know, the Child Protective Service Agency does its own investigation when child abuse is there. There's a criminal investigation. There's a child protective investigation. They have a central registry of people who have been found to be responsible for abuse. It's different than a criminal investigation. So sometimes you're on the central registry, but you didn't put, get put in jail. The central registry makes it so that you can't get a job as a teacher. Okay. We should be checking those registries too. Okay. And it requires an extra process. Um, and also, you know, so in, in having them have the background check before they start their calling. Right. Um, so check the registries, do the background checks, make sure people are vetted. Right. And so you, what can you as a, a member do? You can ask the bishop, hey, this person's just been called to be the young women's, you know, my maid teacher. Has she had a background check? Or this man has just been uh, to, to teach the, you know, the 17-year-old's uh, boys. boys. Uh, has he had a bad background check? If not... One of the things we could do, which is kind of controversial, is we could say, hey, Bishop, I'm not sure I can sustain them until they've had a background check. Got it. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, you mentioned the, the windows and the doors, keep the doors open kind of thing, right? Yep. yep. Okay. Yeah, we talked about that earlier. Yep. Okay. So the, is there a last so, point? Yeah, there is. I would like the, in every ward and every stake in the church for a number of members to step forward and say, hey, this is important to us. You know, what would happen if 30 or 40 members of the ward went to the bishop and say, hey, 
we've got some concerns about this child interview stuff. We've got some concerns about how we're talking about lick cupcakes. We've got some concerns about background checks. We've got some concerns that we don't have a policy. What would it be like if in every ward, in every stake in the church, you know, 20 or 30 or 10 members came forward and talked to the bishop and talked to the stake president and said, hey, we want to do better. Um, we want to follow this policy that the church just came out with and said, we're, we're trying to find new ways and implement them. What would happen to the church if we were willing to go forward and talk? So I'd like to encourage every church member, or even if you're a former member and you've got friends or, you know, kids or nephews and nieces that are in the church, you know, to, to be willing to speak up. We need to speak up for our kids because they can't speak up for themselves. Yeah. If we're unwilling to speak up for them, um, we let them down. All right. Well, uh, any other final things you want to say? Because this has been super useful. Uh, I've had several, you know, we did this on a Saturday afternoon. So a lot of people aren't hanging out on Facebook, but we've had several people who have tuned in say, this is one of their favorite episodes. This episode's so important. Thank you for having this conversation. So Tim, I know that people are really appreciating the fact that you would share your extensive expertise with us. I think you've given us great advice. What final things do you want to say as we close? Good. Well, there will be resources hopefully posted on the show notes here of um, both these recommendations that I have. So you can, if you, if John, you can have that link to, and also the responses to how the church post, uh, um, approaches abuse, my response to that. And, and also the resources of other organizations and churches who have child protective policies. And also Sam Young. Sam Young has a, you know, a good uh, a petition and a website and has stories there. Also, there's a brand new um, website being put together um, by a Leslie Butterfield Harrop um, that is a, a stories for, you know, um, women and men that have had uh, domestic violence problems and talked to the, to the bishop and said, hey, you know, and, and things have gone wrong there. And that's Unrighteous Dominion. Um, dot org. <laughs> you can, you can, you can, this brand new site you can put up. It was under another thing earlier that you can put, you know, read the stories and post your own stories. So part of it, just like Mormon stories, we need to share our stories and we'd be willing to share with those who we care about because that's going to protect children. And thank you, John, so much for the opportunity to let me come on. And, and it's just a pleasure. Your, your podcast has made a big difference in my life. Um, and, um, and um, I just want to, appreciate what you do and the honor of us sharing our stories and we need to be able to hear our kids stories uh, my kid one time he's in college now but he told me dad i don't want to go to young men i don't want to go to this fireside they're just going to talk about masturbation and that broke my heart you know we need to stand up for our kids let's do it all right timothy well you, this has been wonderful i've learned so much uh leslie writes so important thanks for the insight jessica writes loved his recommendations and I join with my listeners in just saying, thank you, Timothy. You've done a real service uh, for us today. Um, really quickly, for those who listen to us uh, live or asynchronously, I just want to tell you thank you for your support. Thank you for listening. There are different ways that you can keep Mormon Stories and the Open Stories Foundation alive. Uh, of course, donors keep this all possible uh, because we have to pay the staff for the work that we do. So if you donate, thank you. If you don't, please go to mormonstories.org, click on the donate button at the top right of the screen, and you can donate 10, 20, 30, 50, $100 a month, whatever you can afford. Just know those donations are tax deductible and they go towards keeping the podcast alive and the staff uh, employed that, that keeps the nonprofit functioning. Um, but there are also other, many other ways you can support the Open Stories Foundation, Mormon Stories. You can like us on Facebook. You can give us a positive uh, review and a positive rating on the Mormon Stories podcast Facebook page. You can share these episodes on your wall with other people. You can share this episode of Timothy Burt with your leadership. Share it with your bishop. Share it with your stake president. Share it with your young men's, young women leaders. Just say, hey, um, there's this expert that's been interviewed. Um, who's trying to help you uh, as leaders uh, not get sued to protect the children. And you can share this episode with them. I think that'd be a great. Um, you can also uh, follow us on uh, Instagram at Mormon Stories. You can follow us on Twitter at Mormon Stories. 
Uh, you can, um, you know, just uh, tell your friends and family about us. There's just all sorts of ways you can support us. And most importantly, go to iTunes and give us a positive rating uh, on iTunes because those iTunes reviews are super important. So thank you for everyone who's joined us. Thank you, Tim, Timothy Burt. And thanks for everyone who helps keep us alive. Uh, we hope this has been useful. Please email us at mormonstories uh, at gmail.com if you have any questions or suggestions or ideas. We really value your input. And uh, uh, we love you guys. Uh, thanks again for everything. And Timothy, uh, we hope you'll join us again soon on Mormon Stories. Thank you so much.